I'm Melvin Morse, a physician, a former intensive care uh, specialist, worked at Seattle Children's Hospital for about 20 years and was a professor of uh, pediatrics there. And I got interested uh, in near-death experiences um, because I started to hear these reports from children that I personally resuscitated. So it just, you know, I understand why people are skeptical of this and have a hard time getting their head around it. Because when you, you know, you read a story that someone else has told, um, you know, you don't know whether they're putting you on, you don't know if they're attention seekers, you, you, you just, you know, you just don't know. Um, yet I had the experience, we resuscitated a young boy um, whose uh, pacemaker failed. And uh, in, in the lobby of Seattle Children's Hospital. And we resuscitated him right there. And he dramatically opened his eyes and looked at me and said, that was weird. You guys just sucked me back into my body. <laughs> and, you know, so it, it, I, I just feel privileged uh, to have heard this kind of experience. And once I started looking for him, uh, I found that virtually all children uh, who survived cardiac arrest uh, had uh, this experience. We looked at uh, 26 uh, children. You know, it's not like TV. Not many survive cardiac arrest. Um, most people die uh, or, you know, are profoundly affected by it. So over a 15-year period, we found 26 children who survived, and 24 of them had something like a near-death experience. And, and it just, you know... I, Wow, I mean, you know, it really uh, set off a lifelong uh, search uh, for me. The uh, one uh, boy, um, every one of these experiences is different, by the way. Uh, so, you know, that's another thing that, uh, you know, studying children, uh, they're not culturally conditioned, you know, so they're not going down, uh, some went down tunnels, but, you know, they're not, you know, all the same story over and over again. Um, anyway, this uh, boy said that he accidentally got into the animal heaven, and then uh, he was relocated to the human heaven, and he told me about his various experiences there. And then he says to me, but was it real? Because if it is real, you tell all the old people. And so that's what I've spent most of my career doing, is trying to figure out if these experiences are real. And you know, short answer, yeah, you bet. They're absolutely real. Um, you know, I think that's the best that can be said about it, uh, too. I, uh, you know, I, I, I've been on these various uh, Facebook uh, groups, etc., and I understand all the various this, that, and the other. I, I think that if those obscure the fact that these experiences are real, um, and I think uh, ultimately uh, very hard to understand because they come from each person's uh, personal psychology. But uh, I'll, I'll tell you, <laughs> this little girl, um, she had infectious mononucleosis that infected her heart. And so, <laughs> I mean, she was resuscitated. We took a needle and stuck it in her heart and to inject uh, epinephrine, you know, uh, life-saving medication. So she's near death. That's near death. And afterwards, uh, she tells me about seeing her grandmother. And she goes, I was just so shocked to see her, you know, <laughs> because she had died. She's like, and then she said to me, and then I was back. And so I said, well, what do you mean you were back? And she said, that's what I'm trying to figure out. <laughs> Uh, I think that, you know, that, that really sums it up. And, and again, makes me, I feel I have an obligation to share these experiences with people because I never heard uh, this young girl tell her story like that again. You know, I had that experience that, you know, of her, that's what I'm trying to figure out. You know, Six months later, when she's telling the story, you know, it's, I was out of my body. I was, you know, I mean, it, because once she starts to learn about near-death experiences and she hears what other people's experiences are like, uh, you know, you know, obviously um, she's going to, you know, change, uh, uh, you know, to fit with, 
you know, people think a near death experience should be. But at that first time where she said, hi, then I was back. That's what I'm trying to figure out. You know, you know, that's completely authentic. You know, that really happened. So what questions do you have for me? I mean, I've really, um, I'll, if you want, I can briefly sketch my career for you. Um, my, I, I went about this in a very systematic way and I've published in all the mainstream medical journals. I've published in The Lancet. I've published in the American Medical Association's pediatric journals. Uh, so I don't have any trouble publishing uh, these sort of articles. And, you know, I'm always, I always laugh and, you know, people are saying, but that's not science. And, you know, this is, you know, pseudoscience, et cetera. Well, you know, the American Medical Association's pediatric journals don't publish, uh, and uh, you know, that's all there is to it. Um, so uh, here's what we did. The first thing we wanted to know was did drugs or um, uh, the various psychological stresses of being in a, in a scary intensive care unit lack of oxygen to the brain, et cetera, did they cause these experiences? And so we did a really nice study in which we compared our children who survived cardiac arrest with identical children who had the same lack of oxygen in their you know, bloodstream, uh, also intubated, also in the scary intensive care unit, also treated with all the same medication. The only difference being they weren't near death. Um, and, and many of them were afraid they were gonna die. Uh, we, we don't see uh, epiglottitis anymore. Uh, that's a pre pretty scary disease, um, but it, it's a swelling uh, of your windpipe and people who have it think they're gonna die. And uh, we, we studied uh, quite a few children uh, who had epiglottitis and they didn't have these experiences. So these are not fear death experiences. So that was the first study I did. So then I was wondering, well, what happens to people after they have this experience? And I discovered something very interesting. They, um, they sort of have a post-traumatic bliss, bliss syndrome. Uh, when they grow up, they tend to give more money to charity. Um, they spend more time in, uh, you know, with, uh, uh, in solitary um, meditation or just taking walks on the beach or, you know, many of them didn't describe it as meditation. They would say, well, I just go to the park and sit for a while. Um, they had more psychic experiences uh, than our control populations. Um, they gave more money to charity. We looked at their uh, tax returns. Um, you know, they were really uh, profoundly changed by this experience. And basically, to sum it up, if you have a near-death experience, you become a really nice person. Um, you know, so, so that's the great secret of the near-death experience. Be nice, spend time with your family, um, try not, you know, be judgmental. They have very little judgmental and no fear of death. So we gave them death anxiety. Uh, and, you know, we, we studied, we actually studied uh, five different control groups to give you an idea of, you know, how rigorous we wanted to be. We uh, looked at, uh, you know, people that uh, were, you know, traumatized in, you know, car wrecks or, you know, nearly drowned, uh, but again, not near death. And, you know, they didn't have this transformation. Um, we looked at people that are deeply spiritual, uh, you, know, you, know, you know, et cetera. Um, so they're just, we documented that they're nice people. <laughs> and, and, and that's really it. Uh, you know, they uh, they tended to be spiritual, but not religious. Um, and, and, you know, these are all children that have experiences. I, I'll just tell you one thing. If, if you wonder what the great mystery of life is, um, I uh, this is a boy I resuscitated, and then I studied him uh, 15 years later. And so I resuscitated him. <laughs> And he says to me that during his experience, he was told, go back, Bobby, you have a job to do. So I was young then, I was, you know, in my thirties, you know, I was kind of jaded about all this. And when you do intensive care unit medicine, you know, you can get callous. And so I'm thinking to myself, right, you got a job, you're gonna cure cancer, you're gonna, you know, save the world, et cetera, you know. All right, so so I'll you know I'll bite you know tell me what, so so what's your big job what what's your job I asked him fifteen years later he looks at me and he goes I already told you what my job was 
um, he had a small construction company that he hired all his high school uh, buddies. And he says, you know, I mean, those numb nuts, they wouldn't, they wouldn't be out of work. Uh, they wouldn't be able to support their families if it weren't for me. <laughs> so, so that's, you know, that's the, the big secret. Um, that, you know, that, that, yeah, we all have a reason for living. Uh, we all have, uh, I, I, I uh, talked to another, uh, uh, you know, young man and then interviewed him later. He says, you know, it's a similar kind of thing. Um, you know, I know I've been really important, very important in life. So I said, well, what was it? He said, well, I don't know what it was. He says, you know, maybe I walked across the street and caused some car to break. And then that kept that car from being in an accident. And, you know, and, and, and change that family's life. That I don't know what it was, but I know that we're all interconnected. We're all here for a reason. That reason is to learn lessons of love. Okay, so we showed that, so we showed that the experience is real. It happens to people when they die. Um, so, well, think about that. So that means the process of death is that um, at the point of death, you have an expanded sense of consciousness. It goes beyond your physical body. You know, I always thought, and I think most uh, you know medical scientists think, you know, when you, your brain dies, your consciousness just winks out. Um, and by the way, uh, you know, um, th this uh, study uh, you know, we did a clinical study, but a guy named Jim Winery uh, did a study uh, in the um, <laughs> only the military can do this kind of study. Uh, fighter pilots and they whirled them in a centrifuge really fast to try to understand what are the G forces, you know, that they can, uh, you know, survive. Um, so they don't want to build their aircraft to go faster than humans can uh, fly them. So they whirl them to the point of death. And his fighter pilots had the exact same experience of my kids, which is basically they remain, they, they don't remember anything. You know, the girl I stuck the needle in her heart, you know, she didn't even remember coming to my office. Um, so that's the short term memory gets lost, as we know it does in trauma. And then these fighter pilots, at the very point where it was determined that blood flow was stopping, you know, and they had to shut down the centrifuge, consciousness returned. And they had something very similar to your death experience, the body experiences, you know, uh, bright lights, et cetera. Okay. So it really happens to us when we die, transforms our life. We learn that um, life is here. You know, we're, we're here to learn lessons of love and that our ordinary pursuits are what is important uh, and, you know, try to be nice. Um, all right. So my next question was, so when children die, they have this experience of entering into a domain in which all information exists. And adults describe this as well. Uh, and it's timeless and it's spaceless. So, well, and they encounter something called God. Well, we can't prove the existence of God. <laughs> you know, I mean, that was just, that's their perception, you know. And I just used the word God because every single child that I interviewed said God. You know, they didn't say a higher power, blah, blah, um, it, You know, um, so, you know, I, so great working with kids. I can just tell you that much. <laughs> I was at a, I, I gave a lecture once and I was talking about God, 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 God. And a woman came up to me afterwards and she said, you know, your lecture was like so terrible. Uh, I don't believe in God. I believe in a higher power. I mean, you know, so that's why it's great to talk to kids because you know, they don't, <laughs> they, they have more. Yeah, they don't worry about <laughs> definitions. Right, a more simplistic and real view of life. Okay, so I can't, we can't, you know, we don't know if there's really a God, but is there a, a domain of reality in which there's no time and space and all information is contained in it? And it turns out, yes. Uh, theoretical physicists describe that reality. And um, uh, information theory, complex systems theory, um, all of these things. Um, now, I'm not saying that information theory and complex systems theory 
uh, validate an all informational universe. However, okay, what is complex systems? Complex systems theory underlines most of the modern scientific advances on use, uh, even economics, you know, et cetera. And what it means is that uh, there's um, really invisible patterns in our life, you know, like let's take a rainforest. Uh, complex system theory can predict when that rainforest is going to break. You know, you can burn, I'm just making these numbers up, but you know, you can burn 50% of it and it'll grow back. But then there becomes a certain point when it goes outside of the boundaries of its domain and it deteriorates uh, and, you know, evolves into something. Okay. So complex systems theory says that immaterial forces, forces that we can't see, dictate the material world. So does information theory. Um, so, well, that is, that, that's huge because by and large, you know, when I, I trained at Johns Hopkins, um, you know, we didn't believe that immaterial forces uh, exist. Um, we think the brain dictates, you know, consciousness. And that the external world is sort of a mechanical system of uh, you know, atoms and molecules and, uh, you know, becoming more and more complex. And all of that uh, came through, uh, uh, you know, the, you know, the um, forces of evolution. So, so I, I became interested in this. Um, well, the only way I knew how to figure out if this was true was to learn to remote view. And um, for those of you who want to learn to remote view, don't read anything about it on the internet. <laughs> I, I, not teach, I teach a lot of people remote viewing. And the first thing I say is don't look it up on the internet. You know, and I think that's unfortunate uh, that there's so many con men and hucksters, you know, this, that, and the other. There's probably only maybe, I'm going to guess, three or 4,000 people in this country uh, who can uh, reliably uh, remote view to the military standards. And uh, of course, the military has been remote viewing for, I don't know, 30 years. Uh, they certainly get funded for it every year, uh, one way or another. So, you know, obviously, uh, they think it works. Um, but uh, I went to the military remote viewers and uh, learn to remove. And it's just a startling, disorienting experience. And I learned firsthand that there is, in fact, an informational universe that uh, we, you know, the, 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 the lessons I learned from remote viewing were exactly what the children told me about the near. Okay, so what's remote viewing? Well, I'll just give you an example. Um, let's say I want you to remote view the Eiffel Tower. All right, so I'll make up a eight digit number that corresponds to the Eiffel. So as soon as I do that, in the informational universe, that number is now, it's like the address of the Eiffel. Okay, I can then give you just the number, nothing else, just that number. And it's a protocol that takes, I don't know, an hour and a half. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's not, it's, you know, it's not like what people think that just like, oh, I know it is. Uh, in fact, those types of experiences are specifically discarded uh, in military remote. Um, and you go through that protocol and sure enough, at the end of it, um, you have described the Eiffel Tower. Uh, you haven't named it. Because, of course, names are what we humans, you know, I mean, those of you who read the Bible remember that God told Adam to name everything. So when you go into the informational universe, nothing has a name. But otherwise, you can completely describe it so that, you know, anybody can look at your description and say, wow, that looks like the Eiffel Tower, doesn't it? And you can draw a picture that looks exactly like the Eiffel Tower. And to do that is just, it's so counterintuitive. I mean, it, it really seems impossible. Um, and yet, it's real. I mean, and, and I, I think it's so counterintuitive. You know, I've worked with lots of people that don't believe it. 
And I'll, I'll tell you what, what happens. Here's a typical thing, you know, um, this happened recently on Facebook, but it's happened to be dozens of times. People will say, well, if remote viewing is real, then, you know, I have something in my house remote viewing. I've seen a lot of so, that, yeah. So then I go ahead and remote view it. In fact, um, uh, I did a demonstration uh, for uh, the, uh, it's called the uh, Spiritist Society, and they had me do it right on stage. And, you know, so I'm like thinking, oh, my God, what if I can't do it? But I did. Um, and by and large, those demonstrations are completely unconvincing. I wouldn't say anybody <laughs> that has, has seen those demonstrations and goes, wow, the informational universe, you know. <laughs> and more importantly, those who have experienced this informational universe through remote viewing, they think that they encounter God. So I personally have never had, that. you know, I, I sort of have the, I don't know, I just stick to the protocol and it worked. Um, but it's not unusual for uh, uh, me to uh, teach someone to remote view. And, and that's a whole different thing than demonstrating it for them. When they actually do it themselves, sure enough, they tell me basically, I mean, it's really word for word with children tell me. And that's why it's nice that I'm able to hear these experiences directly from the children, because it has a, a validation and, and a, you know, a sense of awe. And, uh, you know, I realize now that, you know, on some level, we know everything. And, and God was, you know, God was talking to me. And I've even flipped around the other way. I, I was working with this one woman and she couldn't remote view. She, she wouldn't follow the protocol. And I'm just like, oh my God. Because mostly, I would say, I, I don't know, uh, just about everybody that I teach to remote view can. Um, but anyway, she didn't. So then I just said to her, this is very religious. I said, well, just have God tell you the answer. You know, pray. Just have God tell you the answer. And she was remote viewing a waterfall. And she looked at me in wonder and says to me, well, God said it's a waterfall. So remember, she's starting from an eight-digit number. That could be anything. I mean, it could be anywhere in the world. It could be a person. It could be a disease state. I mean, you know, so this is, you know, my, my professors at Johns Hopkins used to say, coincidence is the tool of the lazy mind. <laughs> so people are just saying, oh, it's, it's, it's you know, a lucky guess on her part. She just guessed that it was the, uh, you know, waterfall. <laughs> they have lazy minds. Um, that's, that's for sure. Okay, so I learned your remote view. And... You know, so, uh, you know, and I think that's, you know, at least for me, that's as far as, you know, I don't think you need to go any further, but um, just the knowledge that we'll all have this experience when we die. And I know you want to ask me a question. Let me just finish one thought, Darren. Um, here's the deal. When I started this research, um, Raymond Moody, by the way, is my brother-in-law and one of my best friends. Um, so, you know, he wrote the original book uh, for, on adult near-death experiences, you know, and he challenged me to uh, do a study on children. Um, it was thought that these experiences were, were crazy, you know, that people didn't, um, you know, they, they were mentally ill or something, you know, they were just making this up. Well, we've come a long way from that. Um, you know, through, uh, you know, I think through uh, my research and others, um, Mario Beauregard uh, at the University of Montreal, um, you know, have shown that there's specific areas in the brain that permit us to have spiritual experience. So now the objection that I hear is, well, doesn't your brain just create this when you're dying? So you have, on the one hand, you have people that say, wow, I had a near-death experience when I died and I learned so much from it. And then now, you know, 20 years later, people don't say, oh, you're crazy. They say, well, didn't that just happen in your brain? 
And I mean, isn't there a part of your brain that just causes that experience when they, they die? Well, Darren, they're saying the same thing. <laughs> they just don't realize it because they're just, you know, most people aren't up on uh, modern neuroscience. But yeah, everything happens in our brain. Every single experience we have, our, our brain is just sitting, you know, it's like, you know, sitting in darkness, just getting sensory input from the outside world. If it gets that sensory input through remote viewing, it does the same thing with it. If a blind person gets visual sensory input through, you know, uh, these tactile vests they put on them, starts having visual uh, experiences. So, that, uh, so, so it doesn't even depend on the receptor organ for the brain to make sense of things. Every experience we have is caused by the brain. And yet I don't hear people say, well, uh, you know, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know, you know, uh, I saw you walking the other day and that was just your brain doing it. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, so, so that's right. These are not after death experiences. These don't happen to people that are brain dead. Um, they certainly come as close to death as you possibly can get. Uh, I'm not disputing that. And there have been studies of, uh, uh, you know, people that flatline their EEG, but they still have some residual brain activity. Um, so, and all experiences we have are caused by the brain. So stop struggling against, you know, uh, this is gonna happen to everyone. I mean, so, but I think there's some people, I mean, let's face it. If I was suddenly joined by an angel, Darren, and he sat next to me, said, you know, some, Dr. Morse is right. <laughs> well, some people would see that as proof and other people would say, you know, well, that was just some sort of mass hallucination. I mean, each person has their own right to do with this information what they will. Um, but I think you're really missing out. Um, the, you know, the, you're, you're missing out on the lessons it teaches us about. And it, and since most people have had spiritual experience, um, you know, all that happens is their own spiritual experience. Okay, that's sorry. <laughs> that's fine. So, okay. so you you mentioned at the end there that um, certainly every experience we have is caused by the brain. So, what would that yeah. mean for these experiences who come back? you know assured that we do continue after the death of the brain that the brain is not the seat of or the creator of consciousness and that there is an afterlife i suppose to put it simply but that is uh that is an element of faith i mean that i mean so you know as a medical scientist i think we can distinguish between you know what is faith and what we can prove but on the other hand it's not just my research, by the way. This research has been in the scientific and medical literature for over a hundred years and not published in the New Age, you know, journal, but published in the American Heart Association's uh, journal called Heart. They, you know, a hundred years ago, um, published a paper saying that when people die, they perceive a transcendental state. Okay, so, so I mean, let's just think about it, Darren. All right, so when you die, you're going to, your consciousness expands beyond the boundaries of your body. <laughs> um, many people have out-of-body experiences, many don't. Um, much of it is cultural conditioning, absolutely. People in Micronesia have different experiences than people in Africa. We study people in Japan, and they have very different experiences. So, of course, you know, everybody has of reality. And you think you see God, you're given a, an, a, a hug. One, a, a physician friend of mine said it the best. He said, when you die, you don't die alone. So if you have a loved one, you know, who's been murdered, he, he had, was in the process of being murdered, um, you know, and you're afraid of what's happening to them, you know, you can be secure that they're dying in an endless sea of love. And, you know, and, and that alone is very comforting to people. Uh, I, I've, I've had hundreds of letters from uh, mothers mostly who say, you know, 
I just hated what you did to my son when he was dying. You know, you took him into this room, you stuck him full of needles, put tubes in him, you know. And now I see from your research that he wasn't feeling any of it, you know, that he was having. Okay, so, all right. So that's what happens when we die. And we know it from experimental research from Jim Winery's research on naval pilots. Well, <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I think you have to pretty much uh, have no common sense whatsoever. If, if, if when people die, uh, they see God, have an expanded sense of consciousness, suddenly realize that their life was about learning lessons of love, and even if they're Nazi prison guards, get a hug and say, good job, you did your best. Um, well, <laughs> that certainly sounds like you're going to live, you're going to live uh, after we die. I mean, sounds like it to me. But if you wanted to draw the scientific line and say, oh, no, that's just some sort of bizarre hallucination that happens to the dying brain. And why would evolution even create such an experience? But anyway, um, you know, sure. I mean, I, I don't see how you can argue with it, uh, it, it really. Uh, I've read just about every book on, you know, proof of life after death and scientific proof of life after death. And they really break down on that point. They just, you know, that, I mean, it, you know, if, if you choose to not see, you know, like for, for example, Darren, um, I, I don't know, you're in the UK. So you tell me that, you know, uh, I'll, I'll bet you would tell me that there's actually a Tower of London. Mm -hmm. Oh, so I'll bet you have, you know, if I wanted to, I could certainly say, you know, come on, prove it. You know, you just, you know, there's some weird hallucination that you're having. Um, and you could not prove to me that there is an Eiffel Tower. I mean, you could send me pictures and I could tell you they were doctored photos or photoshopped or you could, uh, you know, you could show me other people talking about the experience, just like the near-death experience. You know, we could have a club of people that have actually seen the Eiffel Tower and uh, you could have me go to their lectures and conferences. And it, sure, I mean, if I don't believe it, I don't believe it. I mean, that's all there is to it. But you have to be, I mean, let's just be real. You have to pretty be thick-headed if, if you don't think that a child that told me that, that she saw Jesus sitting on a log and, uh, you know, told her um, that, uh, you know, that you could come with her, with, with him, but you'd never see your mother and father again. And, uh, you know, you'd never realize your potential on this earth. Well, I don't know. So uh, that's a pretty, I think, I mean, that's a pretty weird hallucination to have anyway. Um, hallucinations mean a dysfunction of the brain. You know, I mean, but if, if you want to believe that that girl is just, you know, just making up some story, you, you know, then. I don't see that. I don't. I certainly don't feel I can, with it, and nor have I seen any uh, compelling arguments against it. Uh, Bob Bigelow just had a uh, uh, a, um, a competition. Yeah, I had yeah. a competition for life after death. I read them all. I didn't think any of them proved that. I think they make a compelling case for it. I think that certainly they. Uh, there's one guy on the internet, I'm just blocking on his name, but he's great. He says, the evidence for a near-death experience would be accepted in a court of law. So, you know, I, but I think that I want to believe it. I don't think that, you know, it's kind of like remote viewing. You know, um, I notice these people, they, they want me to remote view for them. Then I do it. Then they just, I don't know, they just dismiss it, you know. But they never want to learn themselves. And that's why I uh, learned to remove you, because I, I felt the same way. I felt I couldn't, you know. And like I said, I would say, you know, the military is only trained. Well, it's in terms of thousands, civilians, uh, who can reliably remove you. 
So I understand why people don't believe it because, I mean, we have 380 million people in the country and, uh, you know, and I'm telling you everything on the internet about uh, remote viewing is garbage. So that's a long answer to your question, I, you know, but I hope it was helpful because you really, you know, I, I, I would, people would say these intense spiritual experiences and then they would say, but it wasn't science. You know, I know that it didn't really happen. And the opposite has happened to me. I, I've talked to skeptics, and after really talking to them, I discover that they have had a spiritual experience that could start a religion. Um, you know, uh, but you know, I'll give. Uh, I have a neuroscientist friend who just told me this is all you know BS, and um, so I started to talk to him, and sure enough. He had a profound near-death experience when he was 12 years old. And then he told uh, that he was uh, in the Catholic Church. He told the priest about it. And the priest called his parents up and said, he's saying he sees God. And, you know, that, that's not the way it works. You know, you know don't, don't come around here, uh, you know, spouting uh, this uh, kind of nonsense. And so that just made him so angry. But... You know, he didn't embrace his own experience. And so that just makes me sad. I, I feel sad that, um, it, oddly enough, it's that people don't understand the science. The science certainly supports that near-death experiences are real. And if near-death experiences are real, well, there probably is life after death. <laughs> kind of hard to get away from that. Um, but there's a lot of people out there that are, I think their anger comes because they have unresolved spiritual. But I've given up, you know, now I think, you know, everybody, we're here to learn lessons of love. Everybody has their own path. So it, it still makes me sad. Uh, when I read these kinds of uh, experiences and the way people are, uh, you know, really dismissive of their own spirituality. Our, our culture doesn't nurse spirituality either. So, um, you know, it, um, it, it doesn't. We, we don't. Uh, so, you know, not like uh, I think other people. Um, certainly uh, India and, uh, you know, Tibet, you know, they meditated for a thousand years. <laughs> so, okay, let's think about that, Darren. So you would have to say, agree, that they are the masters of consciousness. I mean, they meditated for a thousand years, over a thousand years. Our country's only been around for a couple hundred years. Um, you know, they didn't stop meditating until the Red Chinese uh, took over Tibet, um, which, oddly enough, was a good thing because all those refugees went down to India, and then they came to this country and taught us yoga and taught us, uh, you know, spirituality. Uh, so, but. So what did these people learn from meditation? And, and they are very intellectually rigorous. They didn't just meditate. They learned geography. They learned mathematics. They, you know, they, you know, they were more advanced, I think, than modern Americans uh, in terms of uh, their intellect and their approach uh, to thinking and critical uh, thinking. Say near-death experiences are real. Consciousness persists after we die. They even go further. They say that the same experience of the near-death experience can be uh, attained through meditation. And, uh, you know, uh, it, uh, well, these are, I meditate, you know, eight hours a day for dozens of years. Um, and remember, in those days, the world was quiet. Uh, you know, they, it's very hard to find a quiet place here. But, you know, when they're, they're, they're sitting in their uh, monk cells, um, but they reach that conclusion. And so I don't know why we would doubt the masters. Of um, and furthermore, uh, Jewish sages in a totally different part of the country uh, in what's now Eastern Europe with no uh, relationship to uh, the Tibetan monks. They didn't last for thousands and thousands of years, but they lasted for hundreds of years. And they too came to the same conclusion. Uh, they 
concluded exactly what we've learned from remote viewing. That one half of our brain is for critical thinking and one half of our brain is for communicating with God. And they describe God exactly the way children describe in your death experience. You know, I don't know. My children aren't reading, you know, Jewish sages, and yet they say it's a domain of all knowledge, of all compassion, of uh, that it's wisdom, teaches you the meaning of life, uh, healing, all that occurs. So there's no doubt that such a domain occurs. In fact, um, you know, that's why theoretical physicists all write these spiritual books and they're part time <laughs> because. That's that's what science is teaching us. Is, uh, uh, Albert Einstein said that the universe is light. I've heard that from dozens of children. <laughs> you know, um, that you know that, uh, that that the universe was light. Um, it, yeah, Albert Einstein's a scientist saying that, and he says that reality is an electromagnetic field. That uh, you know that what we call mass is just concentrated areas of energy. And he said that, um, you know, space and time have this sort of uh, interrelated uh, existence, um, but only because we're conscious beings with the brain. You know, they only exist in, uh, but they, uh, they're not fundamental properties of the universe. So that's what people that have near-death experiences have. That's what ancient meditators say. Um, I think it, at some point, you know, you know, you gotta say, well, maybe it's true. Yeah. So how do you think that those teachings, and I'm assuming that, and I'm going to assume that personally, um, your belief is that we do continue after physical, the physical death of the brain. So if, if we take that as a true assumption, how, how do you think that ties into the knowledge, as you say, that the brain is responsible for every kind of experience we have. So for instance, I, the reason I do currently believe in some form of continuation after death is the amalgamation of, of all different evidence from various different phenomena, such as near-death experience, evidential mediumship, as you say, remote viewing, things like terminal lucidity, past life memories, and all, all that conglomerates into one conclusion as far as I can see. Um, and yeah, I, but... I would consider the brain to be kind of as you say the brain creates oh drop my fly swap um a brain the brain creates conscious experience but i would say it creates the content of conscious experience in the physical form not the the yeah. sense of being itself so it's more of a um was it huxley that said it's a reducing valve i mean there, yeah, there are many that. different philosophies like the dualistic philosophy the idealistic philosophy and of course the materialistic philosophy how would would you agree with that kind of position or what would you think about how to pair those two you facts? don't have to go to add you know to to the non-scientists you don't have to go to uh you know uh, i trained in neuroscience uh I, I wouldn't call myself a neuroscientist just because most of my uh, career was uh intensive care medicine um but uh, i did my fellowship in neuroscience and uh, you know, I think if people want to learn what you just said, um, they should read Dan Eagleman's book, Live. And he points out that even colors don't exist in nature. So, so the experience of color is something we create in our brain. Everything is created in our brain. Our, our brain creates a model of the universe and then it's constantly checking, you know, against that model. And think about it, uh, you know, he, he did a PBS series and he's just so thoughtful um, you know, that uh, explaining this issue that the brain creates everything. So for example, why aren't we nauseous when we walk down the street? I mean, if our eyes were video cameras, we would rapidly get nauseous from the constantly changing, uh, you know, points of view. And, and uh, Eagleman, you know, puts on video camera glasses and you know shows what it'd be like. No, we've already created this world in our uh, in our brain, and then you know we just sort of you know spot check uh, everyone uh, you know to see uh, where we are. So if you understand that, and you understand that the brain 
the brain can rewire itself. I had a patient uh, who lost 70% of her brain and yet she made a full recovery, even recovering her sense of humor. So where was all that? You know, I mean, so, uh, I mean, and, and how does the brain rewire itself? Uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, Eagleman doesn't go, you know, go into this, but he certainly lays the groundwork or that the brain is simply a reducing agent or, you know, some sort of agent of consciousness. I, I don't think you can reach any other conclusion uh, if you understand how the brain works. I, I certainly believe that, you know, you don't have to be a neuroscientist. And I, I believe that, you know, folks like, um, oh, sorry, my, my antivirus has just come up. I think that folks like Anil Seth um, and others have started bringing it into the mainstream. But I, I don't think you really need to be a trained neuroscientist to see that reality as we know it is a hallucination in the sense that it, it is it's not reality as we see it it's reality in the way that the brain can interpret the information it receives so when we see a planet or a picture of a planet that's not the planet in reality that's the planet as far as our brain is able to discern the information it receives i wish i could reach through this zoom and hug you Karen. <laughs> Uh, I think of this every time I hear that the near-death experience is a hallucination. <laughs> um, now, and I, and I, you know, and I, you're using the term hallucination in a non-scientific term. You know, really, hallucinations are disorganized experiences of a non-functional brain. Um, you know, so, you know, they're they're not like dreams. Uh, you know, they're not coherent. They, 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 I mean, the near death experience is incredibly complex. Think about it, you know, every type of, uh, you know, visual and, you know, sensation, you know, et cetera. Um, so, yeah, but using the term loosely, perhaps the right, word projection would be better. Is, everything is created by our brain. And consciousness research, Darren, I went to this conference a couple of years ago on consciousness research. And the first day was arguing over what is conscious. So, and here's, a, here's one of my favorite fun facts. No one has any idea how memory works and how memory can be stored in the brain. And Fred Lashley, who is sort of the grandfather of memory research, at one point said, if I didn't know better, I'd think memory was stored outside the brain. Because uh, he taught rats to run mazes and then cut big chunks out of their brain and they still could run the mazes. And, and Wilder Penfield, the father of modern neurosurgery, also came to that conclusion that consciousness uh, does not uh, depend on brain function. Um, so, so we don't really know, you know, I, and, and I don't, you know, for people who are objecting about the memory, sure, we know about short-term memories and we understand uh, memory clusters and that, you know, how post-traumatic stress syndrome can trigger uh, things. And we know that when you look at an apple and, um, you know, and, and remember looking at an apple, it's almost the same experience. You know, so we do know a lot about memory, but we certainly don't know where it's stored and how it can be recorded. So non-scientists have to step up their game because, th I mean, this is a great field if, um, you know, if you don't have any academic credential. Uh, you know, and one of my best friends uh, has no academic credentials, and he and I won uh, an international award for consciousness so, uh, yeah, step up your game and uh, figure out what consciousness is. And, you know, somebody coming outside the field, thinking outside the box. I mean, that's why you don't see someone like, uh, you know, uh, there's a guy named uh, Dan Hoffman, uh, who does a lot of interesting neuroscientific work, or uh, 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 Eagleman. Um, but they're staying in their lanes. They're not, you know, they're they're not integrating the knowledge of the near death experience. They're not integrating how remote viewing works uh, into their, uh, you know, into into their work. So, and they probably never will. Um, 
you know, uh, the academic world being what it was, I was an intensive care unit doctor. So that helped me, you know, so I could publish lots of stuff. And I did most of my was mainstream uh, work, but I have any number of colleagues that have uh, gone into uh, consciousness research, um, you know, exploring, you know, so-called paranormal stuff and et cetera, who get shut down by their universities. So it, it has to come from uh, amateurs, but, but here's an example of the contribution that we can make. Okay, uh, in the book Livewire, Eagleman says, we cannot imagine a color we cannot see. He makes that flat statement. And yet, I've had a girl who had a near-death experience who made that exact same statement, except she said, where I was in heaven, I could see colors that I've never seen before. So by Eagleman's criteria, since he states, I mean, that's, that is a sentence in his book. We can't imagine a color we can't see. So by Eagleman's criteria, that tells us her experience is real because she's describing colors that she couldn't possibly describe if she hadn't actually seen them. And it all goes back to what you were saying originally. Since our brain creates reality, yeah, you know, uh, we can only create a reality that, uh, you know, that comes to us uh, with our sensor, uh, you know, sensory organs. And we can't just uh, uh, imagine stuff. Uh, that we I think a lot of people, when they talk about consciousness, seem to kind of confuse consciousness with the content of consciousness and the experience of consciousness because to me the question we know for a fact that you know the project it's just to not use the term hallucination i suppose the projection of reality as we see it from our brains um is is of course generated in our brains but the question to me is not how does that work it is what is the the sense of awareness behind all that content what is it that is aware of that content what is the nature of that and that is to me the part of it that is not necessarily generated by the physical brain but is reduced or transceived or received or the image of whatever it is as the brain or through the brain yeah so you don't have any academic credentials you know i read your website it's cool you know it's amazing and yet I've been to any number of weekend consciousness uh, conferences, but that's the kind of thing that you hear debated, you know, at the highest levels of trying to understand consciousness. Um, I mean, you've, you know, that's the heart of the issue. And uh, that's, that's it, you know. Uh, and, the, you know, when you read the Tibetan uh, Buddhist texts on meditation, uh, you know, they, struggled with that same question and i think that that's absolutely true and i want to even go further than what you've said content of conscious of uh consciousness really depends on what we think and what we perceive so one person's near-death experience you know has all sorts of realms and you know uh you know different types of things going on in heaven and castles. And another person's near-death experience, you know, they see a, somebody coming out of a gourd, uh, uh, going to the edge of an ocean, uh, like in Japan, that's very common. Their near-death experiences, they go to the edge of an ocean and they wave goodbye and get on a boat and go somewhere in heaven. So, yeah, that's the content. And yet there clearly is something behind the content. And this comes up with remote viewing that, um, man, you gotta learn to remote view because see, as you struggle with remote viewing, what happens to you, you know, let's take the Eiffel Tower again. So you're trying to remote view the Eiffel Tower. You're getting a lot of imagery, the tall, it's thin, it's, you know, metallic, there's people in it, you know, etc. So right away, your brain wants to say, oh, it's the Space Needle. And so then it graphs content 
onto this awareness or this, you know, this primal conscious experience. And so that, that's called analytic overlay. And we do analytic overlay all the time. You know, I'm doing analytic all the time, the analytic overlay all the time. My wife, I don't know where she is. And, you know, so right away I start, you know, thinking she's in a car accident. Um, that's analytic overlay. <laughs> that, that's a, you know, so, so, you know, that's an example of, you know, a practical example of what you're talking about. And I think it's through, um, when you have a, a protocol like controlled remote viewing, it lends itself to scientific analysis. And so scientists have got to learn to remote view. And then they can start to tackle the kind of question you're asking. Because, you know, I've been, well, the last conference I left early, I, I'd had enough. But all they're doing when they're talking about you know, issues like you just brought up, you know, the content of consciousness versus the awareness, they're just saying the same stuff that you say that anybody says that, you know, there it's not like, you know, they're bringing some expertise to it. Um, and so, you know, we've got to, uh, you know, start moving further uh, and really try to tease out what is the difference. But that's not going to happen until people start understanding that Consciousness is a substrate of reality. And, um, you know, so we're not there yet. We're at a time of a paradigm shift, to be sure. And there's been, you know, seven or eight of these paradigm shifts in Western uh, But I think it's going to be another. Well, here's what I always learned, uh, was always taught. No scientific advance can happen until all the old dinosaurs die out. So, for example, uh, the outrageous concept that you should wash your hands before you operate on invisible germs. Come on, give me a break. Um, what are you just making that up? Even though there's tons and tons of controlled studies showing that washing your hands uh, decreased mortality. But it wasn't till all the old surgeons died off that, uh, you know, they started washing their hands. And you know the same thing is true for using guns, you know, any type of thing. So I still think we're twenty or thirty years away, but um, I, you know, I, I think that uh, it's coming. You know, that's that's for sure. And I think that start, starting to ask questions as you clearly are, I mean that you, that's that's the heart of the issue. What, what you just brought up. Um, so in terms of kind of the science of remote viewing, and it is something that I'd love to learn, you know, properly, but as you say, there's so many scammers and, and unofficial versions of it out there, it's difficult to find. But in terms of, of the studies of remote viewing, I spoke with um, uh, Stefan Schwartz, I'm sure you probably yeah, him, and he seems to be almost the, the, the father of scientific study of remote viewing. What kind of um, scientific research has been done to validate the reality of it? Can you do something about it? The beeping. <laughs> it, there's, you know, I'm at home, you know, like That's we all fine. are. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So I'm so glad you got Stefan Schwartz on. I don't think anybody's more familiar with the literature than Stefan Schwartz. I don't know if he still has this on his webpage, but he even has studies showing that, um, you know, he, he's sort of a collector of studies and he's got a study showing that um, uh, bacteria work cooperatively in what seemed to be, uh, you know, some sort of consciousness uh, existing between them. And when birds turn in flight, um, you know, the same kind of thing, you know, it happens if they have some sort of telepathic awareness. Um, so, but, <sighs> Controlled remote viewing studies, you know, I, 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 unfortunately, uh, I think that probably I've done, well, there's a peer lab. There was a guy named Bob Jan, who was an engineer uh, at, um, a professor emeritus of engineering uh, at Princeton University. He did tons of studies uh, on, uh, remote viewing 
And uh, I, with a group called IRVA, did an interesting study in which we tried to systematically, you know, give uh, subjects, uh, you know, targets, you know, give six people the same target and, you know, see percentage of them. Um, we did an interesting study in which we infected uh, tomato plants uh, with the tobacco mosaic virus. And uh, we showed in that study that the controlled remote viewing protocol was really the only protocol that works. Um, the other protocols, you know, well, we even did a sham, <laughs> a sham uh, controlled remote viewing protocol in which we just sort of jumbled up all the elements, um, you know, just to see if, you know, but, um, you know, that people, uh, you know, these various, we, we took all the protocols you see on the internet and we have people that just felt, you know, they have intuition. And oddly enough, uh, they usually thought they were right. Um, you know, I, you, you got to really, I, I don't know. You, well, that's what, you know, remote viewing puts your feet to the fire. You get a number and then you see whether you got it or not. So unfortunately, we, we had one guy said, oh, I, I got every single one right. And uh, now he's 50 50. You know, uh, he didn't get them all right. He got half of them right, just, you know, that, that you would expect if people were guessing. So, you know, there's a lot of work that needs to be done uh, in the documentation. Um, unfortunately, it comes out of the military. It has a, uh, you know, there's a lot of secrecy involved um, and has a culture. And they're not interested in public studies. They're not academics. Okay, so let, let's get back to um, near-death experiences for a moment. So I'm interested in one of the main aspects of near-death experiences that made me really consider the reality of them as opposed to just being neurochemical effect of a dying brain is this, the, the veridical perception aspect of them, um, veridical perception during the out-of-body um, stage for example you know and there are many that or at least more than enough that have taken place documented while the brain was as you say flatlined or in a state where it should certainly not be able to produce lucid consciousness or consciousness at all for example the pam reynolds case um, which i'm sure you probably are aware of um what are your thoughts on that kind of phenomena did you hear of any in your child um reports or elsewhere tons, of, tons and tons of them um so veridical Tell me what that word means again. Veridical perception. I, I it was um, it was coined by Dr. Jan Holden, um, and it means effectively where you where they come out of their physical body and are able to report um, report events that take place accurately, whether it be kind of around their physical body or in the next room or in the next state or wherever else, okay. it, where they shouldn't be able to, basically. Yeah. Okay. Um, let me start by saying. Uh, uh, on unsolved mysteries, uh, uh, we presented uh, that kind of thing. Um, I've documented any number of those kinds of cases. Uh, children frequently had them, um, and uh, you know, like you say, you know, right? Um, George Ritchie, uh, one of the early pioneers in uh, remote viewing, etc. But, okay, now I've said that, so I've reassured you, I believe it's real, blah, blah, blah. Okay, Aaron, we now have to stitch together those beautiful insights that you had earlier with this information. There's no body to go out of. We just create th this current perception that we're sort of behind our eyes with a video camera, that happens to just be um, I, I think uh, 70 or 80 percent of humans have that perception. Um, there's primitive tribes uh, which don't have that perception, which have a sort of out-of-body state all the time. And uh, they have a kind of a, a sort of a spatial sense because they're in, uh, you know, primarily in jungles. So they need to know uh, where they are. And their language is very interesting. You know, we say, hi, how are you doing? They say, where are you? You know, and 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 where are you headed? Uh, and uh, you know, um, they have more complex language, so they spend a lot of time on that. 
And when people go to live with these people, they start to develop that same sense of consciousness. And I heard uh, one of these uh, uh, women on uh, NPR was describing it. And she said it suddenly became very weird that she sort of had the sense of being out of her body and seeing a little dot. It was her that was moving around um, just because she was in a culture in which everybody else did that. And you know, so there's no way that she could have any kind of meaningful social relationship with uh, people who have a very different uh, reference uh, for me. So it's, when we say that it's all models, that we have an internal model, well, that's what we mean. So that means that the out-of-body experience is just a different model. That's why I, when I said to you, I just say it's an expanded sense of consciousness that you know they're they're going more into the informational universe so they're picking up more information to put into their mental model but the out of body experience uh, first of all lots of people have out of body experiences and are not near death um lots of people uh just wake up in the middle of the night and take a little stroll and um <laughs> you know look back and see their body so, and they're not near death. Um, so, you know, and there really didn't, you know, there was like back in the 18th century, um, a lot of silver cord experience. You know, people are sort of tethered to their body by a silver. So I always like to tell uh, Raymond that uh, his tunnel swallowed up the silver cord because we don't hear those kinds of experiences. And Michael Sabon did an interesting study um, of his, he's a, a cardiologist of his patients. And, you know, uh, you know, uh, I can't remember, I'm just making these numbers up. A significant portion of them did not have uh, an out-of-body experience. So, uh, you know, I don't see that as any way, you know, that's just another way that the brain is modeling reality. And, you know, we, we just have to understand it at that. And so then, but, you know, I, I don't, actually, this is the first time I talked about that because usually this kind of conversation, you know, is then interpreted as, oh, so you don't believe out-of-body experiences are real. <laughs> uh, yes, you can get real information during a near-death experience that cannot be explained by exposure to the senses, um, you know, to the ordinary, just like remote viewing. So obviously we as human beings have that ability. Um, but, uh, you know, so I'm, I'm sort of giving a more advanced understanding of the out-of-body. And I, I, I really like to do this because then a lot of people, they, they, they go, well, I, one woman, she's really bitter almost. Her, um, she was in a serious car accident. She was very close with her dad. Like, why didn't my dad, you know, everybody else is, you know, meeting their dad and they die? You know, all I had was suddenly I thought I was getting a great hug from my dad, you know, so I was probably just remembering, you know, some great hug. No, she was getting a great hug from her dad in real time during her experience. And I think she's um, just, you know, but the out-of-body experience isn't that floating out of your body, going down a tunnel, and then seeing a light and meeting dead relatives. Well, sure, uh, Westerners have that experience quite a bit. Um, I've worked with prisoners, um, bought them to remote view, uh, have uh, heard their near-death experiences, and, you know, that often can't read, um, and they have very different experiences. Uh, yet they are certainly perceiving things that are outside uh, the fear of body. I'll tell you a funny one. Um, uh, I, this uh, office nurse that I worked with, uh, I was in pediatric intensive care, but you just sort of you know, you meet all the intensive care uh, folk. So uh, she's, um, she's telling uh, uh, in front of the uh, you know, nurse and doctor talking in front of the patient. And um, 
she's telling how she already averted him and brought him back to life. And the guy pipes up and he says, no, you didn't. He said, your machine wasn't even plugged in. <laughs> Remember, he's strapped on a gurney. And by the way, we close their eyes, Darren. So people who think that this is some sort of, you know, that the, the, the light is the operating room light or something like that, we keep their eyes shut. We don't, we don't want, you know, dirt falling in their eyes and stuff. Um, so he, he says, your machine wasn't even plugged in. <laughs> so obviously that was outside his point of uh, point of uh, view. And sure enough, um, yeah, <laughs> they, 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 they sheepishly uh, come back and say, well, you were right. Uh, the machine wasn't plugged in, um, you know, and then, the, you know, in the hubbub of resuscitation, et cetera, it, you can certainly put the paddles on somebody and not realize you're not doing anything. Mm. So I suppose the question then becomes, again, referring back to what we said earlier about the brain creating the, the projection of reality as we see it, how then can it be that if the perceptions that people are seeing outside of the body or from a different perspective of the awareness, which isn't the content of consciousness, but is the awareness of it, how are they seeing information in the projected reality that our brain is creating and yet not from the point of view of sensory input to the brain. So, so yeah, yeah, if you know what I mean. So, you know, that's, that, that's why then we have to turn to the neuroscientists. And so I, I cannot recommend this book. It, it's easy to read. Um, and he did a PBS series on the brain as well, so you can just watch it. But he makes the point very clearly that the brain takes any input and makes sense of it and creates a model from it. So I, I sort of quickly went over, but he does this fascinating uh, thing where he, people who are blind, he takes a video camera and then those signals are translated into just bumps on their chest with a tactile vest. And that information is decoded by the brain as visual information. And he says in there very clearly, I mean, as in, in a single sentence, that the brain makes sense of any information that comes to it from any source. Now, of course, he's not, you know, he's not thinking of the source of remote viewing. He's not thinking of the, you know, the expanded sense of consciousness and awareness, which exposes us to, um, uh, you know, uh, it, it, to more information. And it doesn't surprise me that people create a model of being out of the brain because that sort of makes sense when you're, you're suddenly starting to perceive information from all around you. Well, sure, then you've got to revise your model. You got to start seeing, you know, as if you're, uh, but again, I have the advantage of these are patients that by and large are resuscitated myself, heard their stories for the first time that they told anyone. And sure, um, you know, one young man told me that uh, during his near-death experience, he was headed toward this tunnel. He looked down and he saw his grandfather hugging his mom. Uh, the grandfather had come from out of town. Uh, the young man had no idea. Uh, and no expectation that his grandfather would be there. That kind of stuff happens all the time. Uh, a, a, an adult uh, that I interviewed, um, she was uh, an, I think seven or eight uh, consecutive cardiac arrests. She uh, couldn't communicate with anybody in the waiting room, you know, her immediate family. She just, you know, they were so anxious and, you know, filled with their own emotions that she couldn't get through to them. So she went to her home, she gave information uh, to her son who was there, and then the son came and told them all, you know, by the way, mom says she's all right. And then sure enough, when mom woke up, you know, she validates the story by saying, you know, sure. But remember that this reality is timeless and spaceless. So this is just, I mean, this is just her mental model of, you know, that he traveled to the home. I mean, the soul's not a gaseous vapor 
that uh, you know that, that, that sort of like wisps of smoke that you know then can sort of move around all on their own. Uh, it's not like that at all. It's an informational universe. Our brain is a reducing agent, as you said, and it's just as simple as that. And we take whatever information uh, that we get and we create mental models. And if they're right, and uh, I certainly believe wholeheartedly that children who have near-death experiences, when they say, we're here to learn lessons of love, and we study them 50 years later, sure enough, their lives embody the idea of learning lessons of love. Um, well, so that makes sense. I mean, we have to interact with people we have to have some domain of reality in which we can learn these lessons. We have to uh, have emotions, be angry. Um, I've done uh, things that certainly I'm not proud of, uh, you know, the, you know, and um, that's how we learn our lessons. I mean, it's just, you know, and, and we can't learn them unless we have the system of a brain inside a biological body that can interact with something that we perceive as reality. And when this is all over, we realize that it's this life that isn't real. <laughs> Everything, I just learned so much from kids. I just, I just think it's my mission to share with people what I learned from kids. Because one kid says to me, he makes this exact same point, and then he goes, yeah, you know, this is real. But that other place was realer than real. And that's a very common report, especially from children and both and adults as well who experience near-death experiences. I wonder, a lot of people, when they think of death, the first thing they're concerned about is never seeing their loved ones again. And yet, as you say, especially in Western culture, we hear of near-death experiences in which they do meet their loved ones and that seems to be backed up by things like evidential mediumship and various things like that where information is given that the medium themselves didn't know and perhaps only the the relative and the person the sitter knew um, which seems to validate the possibility that there is some form of reunion that can that the loved one still exists in another form what do you think to that kind of experience? Do you think that those who visit their or find their loved ones after death are genuinely their yeah. loved ones? Yeah, so this is where I'm putting my energies now. You know, I, I'm sort of done. You know, I, I gave you my sequence, and I, I think at least for me, that's as far as I can go. Um, you know, these these experiences are real, and this informational reality that's filled with unconditional love is real and seems to be the substrate of reality. So, now, we don't have to talk about the other side we don't have to um you know uh bring in a lot of woo, -woo paranormal science because 80 percent of the matter in the universe is invisible to us and it's not like it's in some other place it's right here so 80 percent of the matter of reality is intermingled with this reality we see so we have no idea what uh, that uh, reality is, is going on, but it certainly uh, would be then a fertile place uh, for people um, to, uh, you know, to go when they leave this universe. Maybe they've got other lessons to learn and those are other domains. Um, you know, they're both with the same subatomic particles that are in this reality that we see. Uh, they're not identical ones, but they're, you know, in the same family. Quarks, you know, have all uh, certain quarks that are in this reality, and there's certain quarks that are the basis of other realities. So, and this is what I was telling you before, that just my heart breaks when, when people don't see the obvious, that there obviously is something else and you don't have to look to evidential mediumship about uh, easily 50 percent of american spouses see or perceive uh, their uh, loved one after he or she dies uh, 75 percent 
and other cultures, Japanese cultures, of that experience. But in this culture, they're just dismissed as a crazy widow's fantasy. You know, they're just they're just dismissed. And you know, that's why I'm so firm on the scientific backing of the near-death experience. Because if near-death experiences are real, then all these other experiences are real. I mean, you know, I mean, it's just a whole different way of looking at reality. And when I work with grieving parents, you know. You know, I talk to them about that. They have to pay attention. They have to um, be aware. Because sometimes uh, the message comes through a better. Uh, I had uh, one um, parents of a patient who felt that them getting a parking space at a particular moment was an intervention. And I see no reason not to believe it. Um, it, it you know, why not? Um, my mother, since she knows that I'm a concrete thinker and, you know, don't really, <laughs> I don't know, this stuff is hard for me to believe. Um, so uh, she told me that she would uh, send me dimes, um, you know, after she passed to communicate with me. And I can't tell you how many times I have found dimes in places where there is no dimes where there's no way that a dime could get there. And um, yeah, I mean, so if it, people, you have to open your hearts and open your minds because you are having these experiences. And by and large, communications do occur um, in my experience. My experience is that often the frustration and anxiety prevents you from having an experience. That's very, but um, just, you know, look around is, um, and, you know, sometimes I think that mediums cloud the issue uh, because, uh, you know, then there's a controversy. Are they real? Are they con artists? Are they doing cold reads? Are they not? You know, whereas uh, I find that, um, and most people either have these experiences, grieving parents, or they can have them. Uh, you know, by there's two techniques that I use. One is to have them make a sincere thought before they go to bed, and then write down the first thought that they have in the morning in a journal. Do this, you know, for weeks, and by and large, they start to see a communication coming. The other uh, way I do uh, is to encourage is to, for people to engage in rituals which are meaningful to their loved one. So for example, this young man died in a motorcycle accident. Um, his uh, habit was to come home from school and then he and his mom would talk for an hour and she'd bake cookies and you know all this kind of thing. So um, I, I encouraged her to do that even though you know uh, you know, he obviously wasn't present, but just to recreate that experience. And sure enough, a communication. So, yeah, uh, that's a long answer to say yes. You know, I, I think that uh, after-death communications are an obvious, um, uh, you know, uh, I guess, you know, building on the knowledge that near-death experiences are real. Okay, great. So I think the last thing I'd like to go into is more on a personal basis and just confer, are you definitely happy to go into this area mm -hmm. okay perfect because i think i know the internet and a lot of people will kind of use try to use your past as a way to kind of discredit your work so w would you like to just kind of go over 2012 what what happened yeah i was in a really a terrible marriage uh, with um uh, I had a midlife crisis. Married a woman 17 years younger than me, um, you know, and it came with all that that was involved. And I had uh, retired from medicine um, as taking a drug called interferon. Uh, for and this is a makes you really angry and irritable. Um, and uh, uh, 
stepdaughter had thrown up on himself uh, and, and a fit of rage, uh, I just took her and just put her in the tub of water. You know, just like, I'm going to just wash you off. You know, I'm going to get that vomit off. And she was terrified. Uh, I don't think the fact that I was taking interferon <laughs> made it a, any better experience for her. Um, you know, I certainly uh, deserve to be punished for it. Uh, went to prison for two years. Great experience, by the way. Big part of my spiritual. Taught people were remote view, taught fellow prisoners to meditate. But, you know, that's a whole other story. but um, yeah, um, it was a crime. And I did it. Uh, so, you know, well, I, I just want to say one thing since you mentioned it. So, all righty. Okay. So that's what happened. So this somehow got turned into that I was waterboarding her. And, um, uh, and it was like crazy. I mean, you know, it, it, you could argue that it's very difficult for me to get a fair trial. Luckily, I had a great jury. Um, who got it right. But I was then charged with four counts of waterboard. Um, and, uh, you know, and those, uh, you know, uh, uh, convicted me of misdemeanor, you know, being with her uh, while I was washing her hair. But, certainly, uh, you know, I was uh, convicted of uh, torturing her. Um, and so, you know, unfortunately, you know, a lot of that, uh, you know, went crazy. And then, you know, the way the world is, it's not like somebody comes afterwards and cleans up and then says, oh, by the way, <laughs> he didn't he, he didn't actually waterboard her. Oops, our bad. Um, he really just got uh, angry because she threw up on herself and uh, behaved in a totally, uh, you know. And one act of violence can undo a lifetime of good work. You know, so one act of anger could do that. So, you know, that's people have to assess that for themselves. Uh, I, I haven't personally, uh, you know, had, um, you know, I'm still invited to lectures. When I got out, I was afraid that I'd be ostracized. And I was welcomed back to the various uh, research, you know, and research partners, you know, et cetera. Um, my family, you know, they completely understood. My brother wrote to me every day when I was in prison. And, and I learned so much. Darren, I learned that I have eight friends. And they weren't even who I thought they were. <laughs> well, and I met, well, I can just tell you, you don't know who your friends are. I don't think anybody has until that. So that's great. I mean, I learned that I had eight friends. And, you know, my trial was about the whole waterboard and all that kind of stuff. But I never denied what I did uh, that I was convicted of. And, you know, I've made restitution. And I have a good relationship uh, with my stepdaughter now. Really touched that, uh, you know, that uh, she lets me hold my grandchild and, uh, you know, and lets me be the grandchild since not really my biological child. And, you know, so I've done that work. And, you know, that's important work to do. I mean, you can't just glibly say, oh, I'm learning lessons in love. You have to actually learn them. Mm. And it shows and in I the say, actions more than the words. Yeah, I, you know, I'll tell you this much. You know, I told you how remote viewing taught me that, um, you know, that, near-death experiences, or at least that aspect of it, are real. This statement that we're here on Earth to learn lessons of love, I absolutely believe it. My own life totally shows that. Um, you know, uh, I did something wrong, went to prison, and then I did the hard work of uh, reestablishing a relationship and learned my lesson, you yeah. know. Great. Well, I you know, really appreciate the openness. And I think, you know, we can always look back on things that we've done in the past and beat ourselves up. But it's, I think the most important thing is to look at what those experiences taught us and how we've developed as a person as a result of them. I have a real interest in working uh, with prisoners and with uh, drug abuse. But I think I have a unique understanding of what's going on in prison. And um, I'll tell you, when I was released, um, 
one guy who had sort of served as my protector. Um, and I don't even know why I, I wasn't, didn't even know him, wasn't uh, close to him. And uh, I once asked him, you know, why, why do you stick up for me like this? And he just said, you shouldn't be here. but, and I'm not, you know, I did not cry. Sure. But um, he said to me when I left, he said, tell them we ain't animals because they're not, they're not animals. Um, and, you know, I have unique ideas of how, you know, more holistic approach of looking at heroin addiction. Half of prison is heroin addicts. Yeah. Illiteracy. Uh, 20%, uh, you know, et cetera. And yet they're as smart, you know, as, in, so as smart as my medical students. So, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to start to work with the population. I feel like I have a particular Okay, great. So I suppose the last question and the, uh, probably one of the most important one, especially I'm sure that Paul would be interested in, um, what would you say to those who are adamant that there is no evidence for near-death experiences, there is no evidence for an afterlife or life after physical death, and there's no evidence of anything other than the brain creates everything about us, and once it's gone, we're gone forever? Well, you're certainly, uh, you know, the preaching the party line. Um, so, you know, I, and uh, I think that one mistake that people make, uh, is that we're always looking for, you know, uh, the slogan, exceptional claims require exceptional evidence. Absolutely wrong. You know, I, I can, I've shown people exceptional evidence over and over again. No, it's, it's the new paradigm that's coming. It's going to take thousands of tiny research studies. It's going to take a better understanding of the brain. It's going to be, you know, the integration of cognitive neuroscience and um, religion and information theory and, you know, uh, engineers that uh, use complex system theory on a uh, you know, daily basis. And, you know, that's, that, that's what it takes. It, it, it really requires a paradigm shift. And I don't think right now you know, I mean, if you, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's the scientific party line. So, you know, when you're in the middle of a paradigm shift, uh, you know, it's, you know, 30 years from now, you know, those same people will say, well, of course, we knew it all along. Mm, the stages of a paradigm <laughs> shift. Yeah, yeah, we're in a uh, throes of a paradigm shift, and it's going to come from all different areas, just like all the other paradigm shifts. It's going to come from anthropology. Um, I mean, Jim Winery published his studies, experimental studies that documented that near-death experiences are real, published them in aeronautic experiments. You know, so it just, you know, takes somebody like me, or frankly, Bob Bigelow, you know, he's with the National Institute of Discovery Science, you know, just a genius at, at blending different disciplines. Um, you know, but that's what it's going to take. Uh, um, and uh, I, I, think, I think that for those who say the science shows this, yeah, you're right. I mean, that's, you went to, here's what I find. The, if you go to an older neurologist, yeah, then they'll tell you that straight out. But younger neurologists are fascinated by it. I think that any neuroscientist and neurologist, you know, that's under 40 years old, Sure, they might still have the party line, but they're, you know, now they talk about the mind brain body as one unit. You know, well, once you start to talk about the mind brain body, and that's routinely talked about in the neuroscience circles, um, you know, you're getting pretty close uh, to um, that, uh, you know, that the mind uh, could be. And, and by the way, um, the world's most respected scientist is named Robert Lanza. He, he developed cloning when he was 13 years old and, and went to Harvard University and started showing him what he was doing at home. Um, and he's just brilliant. And uh, he absolutely believes that consciousness uh, dictates reality. So 
I mean, uh, you know, but again, uh, you know, most of uh, his reasoning, but he's published it in American Scientist, and it's not the new Rue Journal. Um, and, uh, you know, he's published it there. So. It's creeping into mainstream science with, yeah, as you say, yeah. Robert Lanza, biocentrism. But it, even so, you know, he certainly received a lot of backlash for even daring to, to put his views across, which, you know, unfortunately yeah. did seem to turn him from being one of the most respected or the most respected scientist on the planet to being ridiculed for no good reason other than, you know, giving a part a, a, a opinion which goes against the mainstream current understandings. Right. Mm. And it shows you why I'm sure a lot of people, and you wonder how many scientists, you know, very brilliant scientists do hold these beliefs, but don't dare voice them. That's like when I was at Seattle Children's Hospital. During the day, everybody would say, yes, what's this about? You know, come on, you know, what's your study about? You know, nuts. Um, the head of the ICU and the head of the Department of Neurology, uh, you know, were my uh, partners uh, in that research way but then at night they would call me up and tell me amazing stuff so you're absolutely right <laughs>